this time on Mega Shippers. Harbour Master Stephen Scally has the economic future of a Scottish town in his hands as he prepares to export three offshore wind towers. I'm always nervous with these size of ships coming in. Anything go wrong then, it could be a disaster. On the Humber Estuary, just outside Grimsby, heavy haulage man Terry Savory winches 130 tonnes of locomotive onto a narrow trailer. Just coming up to the jump rail now, Jamie. And in Sussex, unload supervisor Robin Merry is under pressure to reap rewards from old soil. If it doesn't make the cargo, it costs everyone money. We're out on the wire, that's for normal with shipping. Across the world, there's a hidden army of workers who keep the world's cargo moving 365 days a year. Whether it's high value... If there's any damage, my neck's on the line. ..or high volume. One miscalculation. No, 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 no. I've got 10 metres to go ahead. One change in conditions. I started to completely fell down. Could spell disaster. Mother Nature stamped her feet. With reputations and lives on the line. Yeah. They'll do whatever it takes to ensure the cargo gets delivered on time and in perfect condition. These are the mega shippers. Campbelltown in the west of Scotland, on the southern tip of the Kintyre Peninsula. A natural harbour known for exporting whisky is now home to a new industry, making offshore wind turbines. CS Wind are building 200 towers over the next two years. Huge sheets of steel are pressed into sections and welded together. Each tower made up of three pieces up to 36 metres long. Each individual tube coated in zinc, aluminium and three layers of sunshine resistant paint. Three new towers in nine sections are ready to be exported and installed in the Irish Sea as part of a new wind farm for the power company Orsted. But the only way they can be transported is by sea. The cargo vessel Rotravente is heading into harbour to pick up the towers and take them to Belfast ahead of installation. Good morning. Good morning. Harbour. Yes, good morning, sir. The pilot will board on arrival. Guiding the vessel through the estuary and into the harbour is navigation pilot Robert Keir. Yeah, I arrived in town last night and it was about 25 knots of easterly wind. Uh, we made a real tricky job today, but we've just, just this morning, it's just turned flat calm for us. So we've got this weather window. With the weather due to stay calm, Robert takes the pilot's motor launch to meet the cargo ship and get on board. Harbour master Stephen Scally stays dockside to check everything's ready. Today we've got uh, one of our large ships coming in to load the uh, offshore towers. And uh, the ship, she's 142 metres long and she's 6,500 tonne. For this ship, the navigation is quite easy, it's more the berthing. That's the challenge, that's why we have tugs and pilots. It's a one and a half mile journey out to join the Dutch cargo ship Rotravente. Uh, captain of a ship should know his ship very, very well, but the captain cannot be expected to know every port in the world that he may go to on an intimate basis, so therefore the pilot's hired to guide him through the most dangerous part of the trip, which is the last, the last bit with shallow water and fast currents and things, you know. But it's a very big ship for the size of port, so it's quite a tricky job. We'll climb up the ladder, go on the ship. It's quite dangerous. Yeah, unfortunately, there, there are deaths every year. We lost one of our colleagues in London this year, falling off a ladder. You just have to be very careful. With the Rotteravente travelling at around five miles an hour, the pilot launch must pull alongside, matching the cargo ship's speed. OK, guys. It's a critical manoeuvre. Oh, 
Morning, okay, sir. morning, sir. Thank you. Board, Thank sir. you very much. Yeah, Harbour Master Pilot uh, Stephen aboard Abima Devar Island. Uh, all good, 6.3 max. No known defects, and uh, on they went to you. Back on the dockside, Harbour Master Stephen Scally must get the 142 metre long Rotravente safely docked. Well, we're not a massive harbour, but yeah, it's a very big ship for us. I'm always uh, nervous with these size of ships coming in because these situations, quite a lot of things could go wrong. If you hunt it, get tugs, anything go wrong, then it could be a disaster. Communication between the tug captain and the pilot is crucial as the rope's attached. Yeah, just stretching the gear now, Bob. Stretching the gear, thank you. Tug is fast, captain. OK. All right, Harbour. Harbour, pilot. Probably about 15 minutes away from uh, entering now. The German captain, Derek Snyder, is relying on Robert's local knowledge of the shallow waters surrounding the harbour. We're going to come up, not heading for the port, but heading further to starboard to give us uh, the sea room to, uh, to swing and be more or less lined up already for the heading of the berth as we go through. So we're not turning as we go in the port. Best to, to turn in the wide area and we'll be already be lined up by the time we get to the port. The Rotravente is 142 metres long and weighs 6,500 tonnes empty. The captain brings her into Campbelltown Harbour at three miles an hour. A tug on standby close behind, ready to slow her down if she approaches too fast. For these size of ships, yeah, it's pretty difficult for them to stop. They'll take a, they'll take a wee bit of distance for them to stop, so that's why we've got to make sure at all times we've got these size of ships and the channel's clear. Going clear? OK. The most difficult part for this berthing is, is the actual ship to come in between the two piers here. There's not a lot of distance between the two piers. You've got 64 metres and you've got a, a ship there at 20 metres beam, OK? The tug's going to help with the ship for turning and its manoeuvrability to come in between these two piers, this narrow entrance, to get berthed up safely alongside the berth here. It's a huge challenge to get the 21 metre wide ship through the harbour entrance. There's just 22 metres either side of the vessel, but the captain is in full control. If the tug's going to slow us down off, Captain, no need to worry about right-handed effect. Yeah, 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 uh, so. good, yeah. If, if, if I would need a tug, I will let you know. Yeah, that's fine. The oil will stop, so... Spring on, Stephen, thanks. Uh, how many metres to come ahead, roughly? Two five. Two five ahead, two okay. five. 25 metre ahead. OK, thank you. OK. And please keep watching on the starboard side. Built in 1758, Campbelltown Harbour was never intended for a ship this size. But even at 142 metres long, there's still only room for three offshore wind turbines. Five metres, pilot, five metres. Five metres ahead. Five. In position, pilot, in position. OK, keep in fast. In position, fast. make fast. That's the ship in position now, so once the ship comes alongside, we'll get the rest of the ropes out, head lines, stern lines and breast lines, and get the ship secure alongside. Can't relax yet until all the lines are ashore and fast. But at the moment, it's looking good. <laughs> I'm quite happy. <laughs> OK, pilot, all good, in position. That's it. That's me happy now, that's a, that's a headline ashore, stern lines ashore, two springs ashore. So that's the vessel moored safely alongside and everything's secure, so I'm a happy man. Ever make good. Time for a cup of tea. With the Rotravente docked, she's ready to get the three turbines in nine pieces secured on deck. Loading's due to begin first thing in the morning, but some of the sections are still at the factory, five miles away. The Port of Immingham, on the Humber Estuary near Grimsby. Handling 55 million tonnes of cargo every year. The Stena Fortella roll-on roll-off ferry has docked. 
a Class 66 locomotive owned by the rail haulage firm Freightliner needs to be loaded on board to go to Germany ahead of starting work in Poland. Train driver and engineer Simon Grego is in charge of the move. This is a locomotive, it is not a train, it actually runs on its own power and it hasn't got any vehicles attached to it. If it had vehicles attached to it, it'd be a train, it's not, it's a locomotive. It's a heavy locomotive, it's designed to move heavy trains. Anything up to 3,000 tonnes in the UK and our European operations can be up to 5,000 tonnes train weight. It's 127 tonnes in weight, 3,300 horsepower, it's got 12 cylinders and it's a two-stroke engine. It was built by Americans in Canada. She's 21 metres long, almost two and a half metres wide, with a top speed of 65 miles per hour. I've been a railwayman for 37 years, straight from school. Um, uh, my granddad was a railwayman, so it's, it's partly in the family. The locomotive's reached the end of the tracks and needs to be put on a trailer to get on the ferry. But when she arrives in Cuxhaven in Germany, she'll need to get to Poland by rail under her own power. So it starts. This is not started. She's not wanting to play. You can't jump start them. If she's broken down, the whole delivery might have to be called off. Well, I've reset it, so I'm going to try again. See if she'll fire this time. That's a good noise. I said she's going to start. There's no running, so we're okay. So there's no problems there. We'll just get the brakes set and we should be fine. So what I'm about to do now is just release the brakes to make sure they won't come on when we're moving it at all. But the locomotive's not going anywhere until Terry Savory from Alalee's Heavy Haulage has moved her onto a unique modular trailer with 10 independently steerable and height adjustable axles. It's designed to carry the weight of every loco that's ever been built on the, in the UK. And it's just perfect for what we use it for. Terry and the team have to put together a 16 meter long rail track ramp, creating a 2.8 degree slope up to the trailer. That way a bit, Dave. They need to get a move on. The Stena Fortella ferry leaves in five hours, but the locomotive must be ready to load two hours before she sets sail. The ferry is five o'clock this evening. It should take us no more than three hours to load this, hopefully. They can't get the measurements wrong. The ramp must be perfectly aligned with the trailer. The only connection between ramp and transporter are two loose sections of rail track. This is what we call a jump rail. We've just put that in. Now I'm going to position the trailer so there's a little gap either side, and then we're ready to winch the loco on. If the trailer and ramp aren't the same height, the locomotive could fall off the rails. Yeah, we uh, just adjust the height and then we'll have one more final check and then we're ready to winch. OK, Jamie. That's all we, that's all we have to do. There's a 25-tonne winch cable. We only require maximum, I believe, an 8-tonne winch to winch this up, even though it's 130 tonne. We're not lifting it, we're just moving it. So it doesn't require a lot of uh, power. With the winch in place and tension on the steel rope, they can begin to pull a 127 tonne load up on the ramp. OK, Jamie, whenever you're ready. Keep going, Jamie, you're two foot from the rail. Yeah, all good at this then, mate. If the winch breaks, it could roll back onto the dockside. 
the only backup to keep 127 tons of locomotive in place, a two kilogram metal chock. Solely for safety. It doesn't need it, but it's just better to be safe. You're just coming up to the jump rail now, Jamie. As the locomotive approaches the jump rails, it's a critical moment. With the team listening carefully as it creeps along the track. All the banging and cracking is just the ramp on the rail and on the stones that you haven't seen. It's not the ramp breaking. At this point, you wonder, will it fit the trailer? If it doesn't, Terry will have to reassess the whole lift. The ferry's leaving at 5 o'clock, and they must have the locomotive loaded up two hours before departure. Campbelltown, West Scotland. The Rotravente is ready to be loaded with three wind turbines but some of the sections are still five miles away at the factory. After making land-based wind turbines for over 16 years, the company are now making offshore towers, which are almost twice the size, generating four times the power. A big moment for CS Wind and coordinator Leslie Black. Well, today we're shipping out our first offshore wind turbine tower. It's the first of its kind that has been made here in the UK, and this is the first time that we'll be shipping to the harbour in Campbelltown. The towers will form part of the 207 turbine Walney Wind Farm in the Irish Sea off the coast of Cumbria. Each tower has a rotor diameter of 120 metres, with a maximum height of 150 metres, and below the waterline, up to 50 metres of foundations down to the seabed. Three new offshore towers are ready to be delivered, each one in three sections. Twice the size of the land-based wind turbines also made on site. The biggest challenge is the size of the sections. Uh, they're almost double the size of what we're used to handling. The largest sections are 36 metres long and need to travel by road to the harbour, coordinated by transport manager James McKinna. This is a 136 tonne, six metre diameter section, um, all prepped, ready for shipping. First stage of moving this section is uh, positioning our two reach stackers at either end to do a tandem lift. Each section must be moved by two unique lifting vehicles, known as reach stackers, that can lift 155 tonnes each. It's a very complex tandem lift between two operators, Campbell McBrain, Aye, right, Craig. And Craig Connor. OK, Campbell, I'll just get the far away side. Each section of the tower is protected by a steel H-frame. So now I'm just going to lift up and promote until my attachments are in position. Both reach stackers must hook under the metal rim. So that's me, I'm happy that my attachment's in position. So me and Campbell just begin to lift in tandem. Now how are you looking, Craig? Ready to lift you as you are. You want it back? You guys happy, eh? Aye, fine, aye, aye. Negotiate this wee slope, we're doing this slope, we're fine. Okay, come on. Each section is worth around £200,000. Any mistake now would be a disaster. Craig spots it's not level and could crash to the ground. Oh, Craig, oh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Come to me, With the section now level, they need to get it to the warehouse to prepare it for road transport to the harbour. You all right, you're in. Right. So what we're aiming to do here is reduce the swing of the tower because of the movement we've got coming down that hill. So we need to keep that to a minimum. Campbell started turning already. One of the operators has started turning. Once he's signaled to Craig, Craig will start the manoeuvre to push the tower around to, towards the building. All 136 tonnes 
is lowered onto specially designed self-propelled rotators, which take them into the warehouse on a set of inbuilt rails. So, first section's in. We're doing well, but we can't really afford delays. Fingers crossed. The Rotor Avente is ready to leave, and the sections need to be driven to the harbour, but they're so big, they can only be moved at night. The port of Immingham, near Grimsby. A 127-ton locomotive is being winched onto a modular trailer by heavy haulage specialist Terry Savory. The last one's just going over the jump rail. The last of the axles are almost there. Go on then, Jamie. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. That'll do. And that's it. All winched on. The loco's heading across the North Sea to Germany and needs to be securely fastened to the trailer. These are chains and binders, as we call them, and we're going to put 16 onto it. If I could find room to put 18 or 20 on, I would. These lashings, we can put eight ton onto them, each one, quite comfortably, without stretching them, without causing any problems at all. With the Class 66 firmly strapped down, Terry must get a move on to make the boat. The trip to Germany is something else. They have a good and a bad boat, and we never know which one we're going to have. The bad boat isn't too pleasant. You're lucky if you have a TV that works. It's definitely not a P&O cruise. Far from it. The locomotive will be the heaviest individual item on board the Stena Fatella, and cargo superintendent Anders Mikhail has prioritised the load. It's not that easy. With, with uh, special projects, it's always a bit more calculations to be done. The truck, trailer and locomotive have a combined weight of 200 tonnes. We will take into consideration deck strength, uh, stability issues. I mean, it's that heavy and it's above the water line, so it will obviously have a great impact on the stability of the vessel. Stress on the ramp, can the ramp take it? Uh, will I affect uh, the cargo operation, the time uh, it will take to load? The inner deck is 25 metres wide, but Anders needs the locomotive on the reinforced central area to stop the ferry leaning to one side. I'm going to place the locomotive here in the centre of two lanes for the good lashing angles. And the strength and area here on this ship is between frame 12 and 70. So I'm going to make sure that we don't go any further or any more off than that area. The winter weather in the North Sea is also a factor when calculating the lashing. For a unit this heavy and especially this high, uh, we have not only the chance of it slipping sideways, we have to have the chance of it tipping over. So we're going to need to put additional top lashings to prevent just that tipping effect. OK, so we're ready to load you now. What I'd like you to do is just pull around the corner and then you're just going to reverse on the ship. Middle of two lanes, starboard side. OK, sir. OK. Terry has to reverse the loco up the ramp at a maximum of four miles per hour. Yeah, go on, keep going, mate. Joel, healing. Minus point three. Point three. There's no margin for error as the 10 axle, 80 wheel trailer goes into position backwards. So, in the end, I would like him right between these two lanes, yeah? yeah. A couple of inches to the right or left, and Terry will have to start all over again. That's perfect alignment like that, yeah, good. Cool. You can stop him here by this, this line here, that's fine. A safe arrival on board. That's it, job done now. We've uh, got this onto the ship. The stevedores are lashing it to the floor. And then all we have to do is go and do a 24-hour boat ride to Germany and then repeat it all over again to offload. 
At exactly five o'clock, the hydraulic ramp on the Stena Fortella is drawn up, and she sets sail for the journey across the North Sea to Cuxhaven in Germany. The Class 66 locomotive, destined for a new life in Poland as part of Freightliner's rail haulage fleet. Campbelltown, West Scotland, home of CS Wind, a plant making wind turbine towers to be installed out at sea. The last two of nine separate sections heading for Belfast have been mounted on seven axle hydraulic modular drawbar trailers. The convoy is almost 90 metres long and weighs 240 tonnes. The sections are so large, all the roads must be closed for the journey to the harbour. They can only travel at night, escorted by three police cars. At 10 o'clock, the convoy's ready to go. Going out, we have two mid sections, the middle part of a three section tower. These sections are 27 metres long, um, they weigh about 125 tonnes each six metres in diameter, so yeah, they're pretty big bits of kit to be moving along a small country road. It's a five mile journey to Campbelltown Harbour. Yeah, we're off, travelling about five miles an hour. They're taking up the entire road, um, and obviously with the height of them, they, they need to take it easy. Um, don't want to hit any, any potholes or dips in the road. It's the biggest heavy haulage operation Campbelltown has ever seen. We're now entering the town um, and we've got a lot more obstacles to navigate here. The team at the harbour are relying on them being there on time. Any delays now um, to the convoy would, would have a knock-on effect at the harbour. The streets are narrow. On some corners, just a few metres to play with. But thanks to the skillful driving of the team from ALE, they arrive at Campbelltown Harbour after an hour and a half. The convoy successfully made it in just around about one and a half hours. The sections will wait here overnight um, and then when it gets light in the morning they're going to be loaded with cranes onto the ship and then head off to Belfast. It's a massive relief and um, we're all feeling very proud that it's all gone really well. The following morning, with all nine sections of the three complete wind turbine towers in port, they must now be loaded onto the Rotra Vente. This ship is especially suited to carry wind turbines because the main deck has been strengthened because the weight of these turbines is quite heavy, up to 400 tons. And uh, well, you can imagine if you place such heavy units on the main deck, that there might be a risk that the main deck just gets damaged, bent. The cargo vessel has a special sliding roof, a reinforced deck 100 metres long and 20 metres wide, ready to receive three wind turbine towers broken down into nine separate sections. They want to start loading by crane on the forward part, and then they even will drive all the towers uh, section by section to the aft, just to place them in the right position, and then they just continue uh, this way until all nine sections have been loaded. In charge of lifting all nine pieces on board, a specialist heavy lifting team. But they've only got 48 hours to get them loaded before the Rotravente must leave for Belfast. Lift supervisor Charlie Powell is, all right there, lads? Yeah. is in charge of a team of eight and two crane drivers. Yeah, it's coming in now, we're just bringing it into position now. Each crane has a tool known as a J-hook to slot inside the rim of the tubular section. Just a matter of pulling tarp back, Joe, we'll be able to guide it in there enough with tag lines, but just getting tarp out of way. Yeah, Joe's going to go up there, he's going to uh, get the J-hook into position, pull the tarp all in out of the way so we can attach the J-hook, attach the lifting tackle. We'll take about 10 tonne of weight on it just to make sure we've got a secure grip of the jail. It's quite important, it gets it right in the middle of the place and it pulls it up, uh, it 
pulls it up square then. If you get it too far to one side, it'll want to slightly roll the H-frame a little bit. So as long as it gets the J-hook in the middle of the H-frame, everything should be good. But transport supervisor Joe Ryan must get the measurements exactly right to get the J-hook in place under the beam. We just check the flange. A precise fit is crucial for a safe lift. And then, and then just check it, it should be right. But the J-hook won't slot under the circular rim of the wind turbine. We, know, we like to have it right. If it's going to go, we'll have it right. You can't just say, well, it'd be all right. If it, isn't, if it doesn't look right, it usually isn't right. Whether it's a bag of sugar or it's a tower section, uh, you've got to have the right tackle for the job and, uh, and use it correctly. If the J-hook's not positioned properly, the lift can't go ahead. It's, like, it's, it's like perfect fit, but I need a couple of mil. It's like it's just 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 right, not a fit. It should go on. It should do, but it's not. Does the uh, cambered bit sit on the bottom of the tower? Yeah. Spring. We're going to bring it down to the floor and have a look at it, see if there's uh, anything snagging it. It's a little bit annoying, but uh, it's always better to check. If the J-hook fails, none of the giant steel tubes can get on board. We've seen a little bit of damage on the uh, on the J-hook, on the pad here. It's uh, obviously been caught at some point there and uh, it's sheared a nut off there, so it's just causing the J-hook when it sits down not to sit correctly. If they can't fix it, the lift can't take place and there's still another eight sections to load. We're going to uh, take this pad off because it's worn at the top. I think we're going to look, see if we can turn it round and use the bit that isn't worn. The small piece of plastic padding is delaying the entire £2 million operation. These things happen. You can't just ignore it. It's got to be dealt with and dealt with in the proper way. But turning the pad round doesn't work. They need to borrow the pad from the other side. Is it's running repairs, uh, they're not a standard stock item that people carry. You can't nip down to being killed and buy one of these. So, uh, yeah, we've just got to make sure it's repaired and done in the correct way. About right, that? You sure? Yeah. With the nylon pad swapped around, it's time to try again. All right, Callum, you can check it up, pal. It should work now, we've swapped the uh, plate over, so we've got a good nylon pad at the other side now, rather than the damaged one, so confident it should go straight in this time. If it doesn't, we're struggling. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Because it's a bit hard from down here, Joe's has got the eyes up there, so we're, we can only guess what Joe's seeing. So what, get it? The rim of the turbine section is still not sliding down into the receiving slot of the J-hook. It's a major setback, putting the whole loading operation in jeopardy, leaving the wind turbine towers stuck dockside. Some of that's not right, just not playing ball. Shoreham Port in the south of England. The general cargo ship Wilson Garston has arrived from the Netherlands. 83 metres long and 13 metres wide. On board, 2,700 tonnes of old soil. Recycled soil is now a valuable commodity in the brick manufacturing industry. Offload supervisor Robin Merry must get the material dockside ready to be taken away by lorry. It basically originates from the inside of grow bags. Once it's been used and there's no nutrients left in it at all, it's then placed in a pole and brought over as a bulk cargo to show on port. After a year growing tomatoes in the Netherlands, the soil has arrived cleaned up and shredded. Obviously, every, every business now wants to see things recycled and we're very hot on it. It feels like just basically with dirt, which is, has had all the moisture taken out of it. Where it's been used for growing of the plants, you can still see the bits and twigs in it. But you see, it's just like a lot lighter now and it's devoid of any nutrients now. Now used to make thermalite bricks to build houses. Be part of this process of using material that once would have been landfilled and now we can actually reuse it and turn it into blocks. It's good for the future. The cargo vessel must leave on the high tide at six o'clock. 
the team have got just seven hours left to discharge the remaining soil. The main tool for the job? A mobile gantry crane weighing 180 tonnes. It can reach out 26 metres over the vessel and lift up to 30 tonnes. Crane operator Kenny Feeney must do a grab a minute to keep up with the schedule. The grab at the moment is picking up roughly three and a half tonnes at a time. And the cargo on board the ship, there's just under 3,000 tonnes. What you're trying to do is not overfill the grab because it, it's light and dusty, so you don't want it blown all over the place. You try and make as little mess as possible. I wouldn't be popular if something like that happened. Dockside, the soil is stacked up to seven metres high. We're probably three quarters away, if not further than that, through the operation. Uh, we've probably got well over 2,000 tonnes, probably nearer 2,500 tonnes off. As the soil's discharged, the ship's losing weight and becoming unstable. We're down below the four metre mark, so the lighter it gets, the more buoyant it gets and the more likely it is to rock backwards and forwards. Every time he goes to get a grab out there, it rocks side to side, quite violently. With the vessel now swinging from side to side, the operation's becoming more precarious by the minute. You're always keeping an eye on the trim of the ship, whether it's leaning to the left, to the right, to try and keep the ship as level as possible at all times. You can't switch off because you don't want to damage the ship. But the five-ton bucket must get as close to the hold walls as possible to get every last grab. The aim is to get as much of this out as we can because otherwise you're just wasting money. Every last bit costs, it's all money. Despite the increased risk, time is pressing. We're looking like we can get dark in the next hour or so. And we have a pilot book for about four hours' time where the ship's now got to be taken up the harbour. It's got to be spanned round and taken out. If we miss that tide, it won't sail for another 12 hours. We're definitely up against it a bit more now. This ship could really do with leaving tonight. It really has to get on. It has another cargo to go to. And if it doesn't make that other cargo, it costs everyone money. Right on the wire, that's for normal with shipping. Yeah, right on the barn line. Campbelltown Harbour, West Scotland. Three offshore wind turbines have been separated into nine sections and are due to be loaded on board the Rotter Avente. It's nearly there. But lift supervisor Charlie Powell has a problem with the J-hook at the end of the crane's lifting chain. Everything needs a knock-on effect. It slows down the loading up of the ship. It's affecting the guys because obviously it's still on the transport on the quay side. These guys want to be going and getting ready for the next piece. Ultimately, it all comes down to the ship sailing on time, but unfortunately, these things are sent to try us. If they can't fix it, the wind turbine sections won't be getting on board. See what I mean? Supervisor Ian Ritchie opens up the bolts to widen the hook to try to get it attached. How's that, Skip? Yeah, that's it. In, yeah? How come it's fitting now then? Just made it bigger. Happy. It takes them an hour to fix, but it's a successful repair. Just got a slight difference in the flange thickness. Uh, so all we've done is just open the drawer up a little bit to give us a bit more tolerance and ensure it's engaged properly. Uh, so now we're good to go. Despite the challenges, they're on schedule. We're back on track now. We're just going to take a little bit away in uh, the cranes at each end, release the uh, anchoring bolts. OK, Callum, if you can just nip it up for me nice and steady, Callum. Keep your radius and just nip it up for me nice and steady, pal. We'll just uh, get it slightly floating, mate. That's, That's lovely, Graham. Keep coming like that, pal. That's lovely, mate. Uh, three slow, Graham. Keep slowing round to your right, Callum. Nice and steady, pal. Keep coming, pal. The section of wind turbine tower weighs 137 tonnes. It's 27 metres long and 6 metres high. Lifted in tandem by two mobile cranes. Skip, can I lose a bit of height off Callum, mate? You're a little bit low on your left-hand side, pal. Charlie must get each section landed in the right place on deck. Fluid. 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 
with the section safely on board, Transport Supervisor Joe Ryan still has to get them stowed in the right place using four axle self-propelled modular trailers known as SPMTs. The A-shaped attachment on top of the SPMT locks into the end of the turbine section. So the A-frame's the adapter that sits on top of the SPMT. Once they're down and touching, put two pins that sit in the top of the frame. They're, they're the pins that take the weight of the frame. So when we pick up our trailer, the pins on the A-frame pick up the H-frame, picks up the tower. Two transporters, one on each end, lift the wind turbine section just a few centimetres above the deck. 16 wheels across four axles, rolling in parallel, manoeuvre the steel tube. Our biggest challenge moving into space, we've got to move into, we've got quite big constraints, and we've literally got mils and inches of space either side. If the operator or the spotters has a lapse in judgment, and they, they, to go off ever slightly, they could be crashing into something. Obviously, the stuff we're moving is worth millions and millions of pounds, and one tiny little bit of damage can be massive drama in the long run. There's no margin for error, as the transporters creep forward at less than half a mile an hour into the section's allotted area on deck. A bit more. Bring it left a bit, Sam. Come down on Alpha Bravo, Scott. The deck is 20 metres across. With each tower six metres wide, there's just 60 centimetres gap between each piece. By the end of the day, three sections are safely loaded and lashed. It's gone pretty well today. We had a few issues which we overcame, uh, but we've caught the schedule up. Hopefully we'll get everything uh, back to normal. The ship will leave on time. We've all got our fingers and toes. We've done our little bit for global warming, so it's been a good day. The following evening, the Rotteravente is fully loaded, on time, with all nine sections. A miraculous recovery, given the delays. She's 1,170 tonnes heavier than when she arrived and ready for the journey to Belfast. The first complete wind turbine towers made in Britain, heading for the Irish Sea. Shoreham Port, East Sussex. The Wilson Garston is almost empty. 2,600 tonnes of old soil is dockside. But the last 100 tonnes is still on board, and the boat carrier has to leave in four hours. Supervisor Robin Merry must go into the hold to make sure every last tonne comes off the boat. We're going into the ship's hold now. We're going to enter the man cage. Hopefully not like that. Maybe. Yeah, I'm grinding that one. <laughs> there you go. Does that, does, that feel you, does that feel you with confidence? Just to take us into the vessel ship, it's far quicker than using the ladders, it's far safer. We'll just get ourselves in. Definitely, this is one, this is one to test your little nerve out a little bit now. That's it. A bit of an experience, isn't it, eh? <laughs> Every day. Terrific view, you can see over the top of the whole harbour now. That's it, let's get ready for a slight jolt as we hit the bottom. There you go, that's lovely. Right, we let ourselves out. <coughs> if I can. There we go. And now we're in the, the hold of the vessel. Basically, most of the holder ship is empty now. Most of the rock wall's out. But what we're going to do now is we're going to bring the bobcat in and it's just going to sweep up the bits on the edge of the ship now. This along the edge here, this is where the crane, the grab can't reach, whereas the bobcat with a small bucket can reach. So he's going to push it up and down the side of it into piles so the crane can remove it. Luckily, he doesn't have to do it by hand. A three-ton bobcat skid steer loader with a 46 horsepower engine is the only way they can clear the hold in the three hours they have left. Here we go. We're just going to stand back and let him do his thing now. Push the cargo up to this side of the hold so we can take it out with a grab. So he's just going to start moving up a bit at a time. 
and we're just going to stand for it. The Bobcat's perfect for this job. It's a small, nimble piece of machinery, which is able to get right to the sides of the ship and push it all up. It, sa it saves a lot of time and effort by hand, having to sweep by hand. Driver Jake Hollands has limited room for manoeuvre and only a couple of hours to stack the remaining compost for the crane. It's all driven with by the hand. It's got nothing to do with the feet, not like a car where you got your gas and your brake. It's just literally the same controls as a tank. So you lose control with the, uh, with the slidiness, but you just got to try and catch it a little bit. Oh, there we go, right. Just get down, shove them in quickly. Can be a bumpy job, but it's all right. It's not too bad. It's not too bad. I like that bit, that bit's bumpy. Don't like bumpy bits. The hold must be completely emptied before the ship leaves in two hours, and the crew have to pitch in with shovels. But there's an issue. Right, slight problem we got in a minute. Slight issue is, I say, the height of the, the height of the cargo going up the side of the ship is caught in, sort inside some of the ruts of the ship, and we can't clear it. It's way beyond our height of working. Far too dangerous. So we're going to liaise with the guys in the ship and the captain and see if we can come to the solution. They've got any equipment to help us. We can't get it. They'd have to come and have a go. A quick solution. A pole, some gaffer tape and a trowel. All this multi-million pound equipment, two sticks have arrived and we're back in business. With the improvised tools, the hold will be properly cleared out and the team can finish the job. A really successful day. We're on the last couple of grabs out of the ship now. The ship's going to be away on time. That's the main thing. Spot on, no, no delays whatsoever. And everyone's safe and well and we'll be home for dinner in about the next 20 minutes. Quayside, the lorries are already rolling through to take 30 tonnes at a time to the brick factory, 100 miles down the coast. Yeah, it's great to see it. It's great to see this, this is what this world's about now. Recycling is what this is all about. We need to look after our planet. Over the last hour, before high tide, the hold is completely cleared out. All 2,700 tonnes discharged in 12 hours. But this isn't a one-off event. By nightfall, the Wilson Garston returns to the Netherlands to collect more soil to be recycled into bricks for a greener construction industry in Britain.